her master's degree in 1978 at Appalachian. And then she went on in the early early 80s and got her PhD, or not a PhD, or EDD doctorate from uh, Virginia Tech. Nice. Well, so are y'all both born and bred in North Carolina or? Uh, she is, and I'm a born and bred East Tennessee. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. a Tennessee hillbilly, so. <laughs> like Johnson City or Knoxville yeah, or, or? Irwin. Irwin near Johnson City. Okay. I, I know where Johnson City is. I don't know about Irwin, but. Well, if you go to Asheville from Johnson City, you go right through Irwin. Okay. It's one of those things. Yeah. I'm from, yeah. Okay. That makes sense, man. It's a real small world, man. So. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I would have never dream that, but. I, it is a terribly small world. I was talking, I did a, a, a conference today with somebody in uh, New Zealand. Wellington, New Zealand. Really? And it turns out one of the people who transcribed one of my music books that I had hired back in the 90s over the Internet, he lived in Wellington, New Zealand. It was Dr. Ross Hendy. And I said, do you know Dr. Ross Hendy? He said, oh, yeah. I said, he went. Uh, he used to work for the police department. And I said, that's him. So ironically, <laughs> the person I talked to knew somebody that I knew in Wellington, New Zealand, of all Shoot, places. Dude, man, that's wild, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird just how life works out like that sometimes, you know? Yeah, you, you just never know. So you better be careful, I guess, what you say about somebody. Uh, <laughs> That's true, too, especially with, you know, doing these podcasts and everything now. There's a lot of information out there people can grab. Well, that's right. Anyway, but so let's let's get started here. So, like, you know, so what got you into the mu- whole music thing? Was that something that uh, you just been doing since you were a kid or what? Yeah, what? It, pretty yeah. much. You know, I, you know, born in East Tennessee, if – I'm a Tennessee guy, and I think that it's part of the requirement to be a Tennessee uh, native is you've got to play some instrument. I mean, that's okay. just part of the DNA. You know, you look at Dolly Parton and, you know, Johnny Cash and uh, uh, what was his name, Ford? Uh, uh, the, anyway, the one of the really original country music people. Nashville, Tennessee is Music City, USA. Sure. You know, sure. it's, I, I got to play something, so – my mom and dad both played the piano, and my dad played by ear, and my grandmother Combs, she played by ear as well, and she played, and I have her instrument right here. You know what this is? Uh, um, uh, auto harp. No, it's a, I, I, I auto harp. It's called an auto harp. Auto harp. And it's just an instrument that's it's so simple to play, and it sounds great. It's you just push down on one of the keys. And go at it. Well, I can hear my grandma Combs playing this thing. This is this was hers, and she and she willed it to me when she passed away. I have the note over there in her handwriting. It says, "This harp belongs to my grandson David Combs." So, I, this is Granny's auto harp, and I she played that thing. It's older than I am, by the way, and it still sounds good. And but I can still hear her singing the old hymns and playing that auto harp and playing the old pump organ in church that, back before they even had electricity and. Sure. So I grew up around music all my life, yeah. but, but I was 33 years old before I actually wrote my first song. Yeah. And it's always been a mystery to me. Why didn't somebody in my youth tell me, hey, David, they all call me David way back then. I changed my name later on to Dave. So a little shorter. Huh? I can always tell when I run into some of my old classmates is, hey, David. <laughs> I don't know who it is. Huh? They still call me, and I guess they will until, until I leave this earth. They'll call me David. Sure. But anyway, so uh, nobody ever said, hey, Dave, you can play. You could write music. I, I enjoyed music. I enjoyed conducting choirs and being around music all my life. But nobody ever said, hey, you can write a song. Well, I did write one in 1981, and I did it without even thinking I was writing a song. I sat down at the piano, like the one behind me here, and I just played this song. And it was one of those that just came to me. I, I just played it. I didn't try to write it. I just played it. And I didn't think anything about it either. It was just something I really enjoyed playing. It was pretty. And my wife came home from work a couple of days later, and she says, what's this song I've had stuck in my head all day long? You know, yeah. you get an earworm and you just can't get it out of your head. She yeah. hummed, hummed a little bit of it. And I said, well, Linda doesn't have a name. And she says, what do you mean? You play it on the piano all the time. I said, well, it's just something I made up. She got all excited. She said, you made that up that you wrote that song. I said, well, <laughs> I get, I just played it and sure. doesn't have a name. So she said, well, have you written it down? 
I said, no, I, I'm not going to forget it. It's, it's up here in my, my, my brain. So she said, oh, no, you got to write that down. Something might happen. Truck might run over you and that song would be gone. <laughs> so I wrote it down, the melody and the chords, and stuck it in the piano bench and didn't think much about it. We tried to think of a name for it. Nothing. Couldn't come up with a good name for it. Sure. Two years later, some friends of ours had a little baby girl named Rachel. Okay. And they asked me and Linda to be her godparents. So at her christening service, it was just us and the family and the minister. We're in this little country church. And up at the front of the church is this grand piano in the middle of the platform. And all through the, the, the christening service with the minister saying all his blessings and kind words about little Rachel, I kept eyeing that piano. And I punched Linda toward the end of the service. And I said, hey what do you think about me playing this song that I've been been trying to think of a name for now? Because it seems to be, it would really fit. She said, that's a great idea. So at the end of the formal service, I went up to the front and asked the family and the minister, it would be all right if I play a song on the piano. And they said, sure. So I sat down and I played this same song that I'd played many times before. And I got most of the way through the song, and I kept hearing in the audience, <clears throat> people clearing their throat and a few little sniffles here and there. And, and I noticed my eyes were getting a little weepy, too. Now, if you've ever been to a little baby's christening service, you know how precious and tender it is anyway. And so you layer on top of that a pretty song that kind of just tugs at your heartstrings. Sure. It's a pretty powerful, emotional thing. At the end of the song, I looked over at little Rachel in her mother's arms and I said, okay, from now on, this song will be called Rachel's song in her honor. And that's how it got its name. And that was the first song I ever wrote. It it just took off from there. Everybody I played it for loved it. I got it recorded three years later in Nashville, Tennessee, just for fun as a demo. Sure. And I played it for anybody that would listen to it. A friend of mine had a radio program. He he said, let me borrow it. I want to play it on my radio show. I said, okay. So I, <laughs> I, I loaned him my master real to real tape. I said, now, Bob, this is the only copy in the world of this song on a master tape. Yeah. I'll take good care of it. So they made a copy of it at the radio station, played it that Saturday morning on the radio, FM station. And Linda and I, of course, heard it. First time I ever heard my own music played wow. on the radio. And, you know, that's that's always special for any musician to have their first song ever played on a radio. So that was special. But a funny thing happened. The phone rang in a, in a few minutes after it played, and it was the radio station manager. And he said, Dave, he said, I have been in radio for over 20 years. And I had something happen just now that has never happened to me before, ever. He said, when Bob played that Rachel song on the radio this morning, our phone bank of about 10 or 12 phone numbers lit up. I mean, it was just, you know, flooded with phone calls, people calling in saying, what was that song you just played? Tell me more about Rachel's song. Tell me more about this guy Combs and Winston Salem. And he said, you've got something special here, man. He said, this is really special. I've never seen anything like this. So that was the start of me trying to decide, well, I need to get this thing on radio stations everywhere. Well, that is a <laughs> that's a tall order. Anybody that's tried to get their music played on the radio. Oh, I know. There's all, <laughs> there's all kinds of you. You've probably seen the coal miners' daughter movie. I've with, heard of. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, old Brett Lynn. She goes out chasing down radio and uh, antennas. Mm-hmm. She'd go chase down a station and give them a record to play. Yeah, I did. I did the same thing. Anytime I was out in the countryside and I saw a radio tower, I went and found that station and I gave them a record of my Rachel song. And they started to everybody I gave it to play it on the radio. And then I found out that I could call radio stations around the country, do the same thing. They would, I'd send them a record, they'd play it. And I found the one secret that really kicked it in high gear. So it was a company called Bonneville broadcasting in Chicago that programmed a whole bunch of stations. You know, they did the programming for these stations. Okay. I got a hold of the fellow there who did the easy listening programming, sent him Rachel's song, and he says he loved it. He said, Dave, I am going to put this in my rotation for all my stations. So I went from a few stations all over the country, bingo, 200 stations, all just like that, playing Rachel's song. 
man, it took off. It it just went on like wildfire. I was the number one requested instrumental in Los Angeles, Atlanta, St. Louis, Chicago, uh, Baltimore, New York, all, all over the cities, place. All the big cities. Yeah. So that was big time. Yeah. So that was really what put the song in high gear. And then I started getting something I'd never gotten before, and that was fan mail. Ooh. People would track me down. They'd call the radio station and say, can you tell me how to get a hold of this record of Rachel's song? And what's the address I can write to? My mailbox every day would be just full of letters from people all over the country. All good and, letters or bad letters? Like, oh, good I mean, letters. wonderful letters. Okay. I mean, and eventually, by by this time, I, I have them all. I kept every one of them in a box, and they're sorted by a year. I've got different – every year has got a different box. I have over 50,000 letters from people. Now, 50,000, and that's physical letters. That's sure. not counting emails and stuff. Sure. It is a bunch. And – that really just absolutely blew me away. And that's really one of the main reasons I wrote my book. This Touched by the Music book that I published last year was all those letters and stories that people told me how much my music touched their lives. And I mean, there's some tear jerking stories in there, too. I mean, it, it, people with, that were in a dying situation that, you know, passed on to the next life hearing my music or somebody in severe pain that my music could, you know, relieve, relieve their pain a little bit and little babies born to my music, women and newlyweds getting married to my music. And it went on and on and on. And it's just incredible. So you asked me about my life with music. It was, it really took off in a, in a, in a big way, but it, now all that's an over a longer time frame. You know, I've, it took yeah. 15 years for me to do 15 albums of music, but it was a, it was a wonderful ride all along the way. And, you know, it, it had some ups and downs and of course, of course, starts like everything else in life. But by and large, I can't complain at all about the wonderful life that the music has given to me and that I've been able to bless other people's lives with my music. And the feedback is just enormous. It's just wonderful. Very affirming. Yeah, what what year was this going on in? You know, when you first heard your song get played on the radio, nineteen eighty six. Eighty six. I got it recorded on August the twenty second, nineteen eighty six, at six p.m. at a tiny little studio in Nashville, Tennessee. I'll never forget it because that evening, when I heard this professional musician whose name is Gary Prim, you can look Gary Prim up because he's done all my music for me. Okay, and he is a professional session musician in Nashville, Tennessee, still working. He, he's a hardworking young man is super talented. He's played the piano for the, any big name you can name in Nashville, Tennessee. They, they all know Gary Prim, but he was a young kid in his twenties. When I met him in 1986, <clears throat> he arranged and recorded Rachel's song for me as a demo just for fun. Sure. And I had no idea that this little for fun recording would lead to all this other stuff that happened later on. Amazing. Yeah. That was 1986. Yeah. Those uh, the little things you do in life and just the effects you'll see on later in life. It's just, you know, almost mind blowing, especially, you know, when you don't even think that something <laughs> just recording one song is going to, you know, really take it the yeah. uh, go as large yeah. as it did for you. Yeah. Cause I was working at AT&T at the time. I had a great job. I, I had a career going with, with AT&T. I'd worked with them by the time I finally quit my job in 1992, I had been with them for 22 and a half years. Oh, shoot. So I left a 22 and a half year career behind and said, okay, I'm doing my music full time from now on. And so I never looked back. I never regretted it one second. And it's been a wonderful time ever since then. Well, yeah, you just went and pursued your dream, right? Was that what your dream? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and that's yeah a you know, I, early on, of course, I didn't have any idea of what, what the dream would look like. I'm but I've always been kind of an entrepreneur and, and, and dreamed about working for myself and having some fantastic invention or product or something that I could make a living off of and work for myself. Yeah. You know, there is no, uh, I think entrepreneurs are kind of a special special breed, but to a person, I think they enjoy being in control of their own destiny sure. and their own schedule and what they, you know, they don't mind working for somebody else. Most entrepreneurs have worked for somebody else before they were able to do their own thing full time. Sure. 
But there's no, no substitute for, for getting up in the morning and saying, okay, I'm going to work for me and my family. And everything I do today is going to benefit my, my own business and my own family and so forth. Yeah. And there's just, there's no substitute for that. Oh, I agree hundred percent, you know, finding like you did like that passion and then you put in the amount of work you want to in it. And, you know, I'm a firm believer what you put into something you'll get out of. You yeah. Know, bold and just, you know, not everybody has that though, or has found that and, or they haven't found it later in life. You know, most people go down that track, you know, I'm going to work for 30 years, retire, then go, you know, travel or go sit on a beach. But then, you know, and this, you know, that I think it might lead to a little, I don't want to say depression, but, you know, people almost say, you know, well, I didn't meet my dreams. I didn't meet my passion. So I'll just continue to work my days out here until, you know, like you said, I end up dead or whatever. But yeah, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't matter, you know, if it takes you 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, as long as you find it and yeah, keep, I mean, keep it rolling, man. Yeah. The main thing is you, once you discover what you want to do and what you're passionate about, take some action. Don't just think about it. Sure. You take some action and try something. Yeah. Maybe something doesn't work. Back up, try something else. You know, don't give up and just sit back and say, well, I'm a, I'm a failure. I'm, I'm just not going to do anything. Exactly. You said, nope, I got a, I got a passion for this. I know it's going to work. I'm going to make it work. And you usually find a way to make that happen. Yeah. If you really want something, you'll go after it, you know, mm -hmm. and just, if you can get, you know, it's life is not easy, you know, especially when you're trying to go after something like what you did. Now, if you have the motivation and the will to get over, you know, the little humps in the road and move these walls and stuff, you know, big things can happen, but you know, it seems you know, in, in some of the people I've worked with and some of the things I've seen at my age, it's the first, you know, line, the first bump in the road, people are like, well, now we're done here. Yeah, done. Yeah. It wasn't meant to be. Yeah. That's part of the, you know, if everything was easy, everybody would be doing it, you know? That's right. You know, when, when times are really tough and things are really looking like they're, they're, you don't have much of a chance or society kind of really looks like in a real funk kind of like it is right now around the United States. Things are not looking real great, and no matter where you look, with gas over $5 a gallon in some place, over 6 in California. Oh, yeah. And, you know, inflation, it, it's going to be skyrocketing and, and unbelievable. You know, those are kind of really big, strong headwinds for whatever you're going to do. But it also cleans out the people who don't have the stake, stick to it and, and willingness to really push through. Yeah. So the only the tough ones and the ones that really push and go hard and keep at it are going to succeed. So there, there really is opportunity there, but it's tough. It really requires a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, imagination and all the good things that make a, a, a entrepreneur successful. Yeah, that's one of the things I've said on here before, you know, countless times that you need to challenge yourself day in and day out and find out what you're made of. And, you know, you learn about yourself, you know, hey, you know. Can I get over this hump? Can I, you know, if something gets a problem occurs, something, you know, hard comes along the way, can I have the ability to figure it out and get past it? You know, and yep. yeah, and, and a lot, I don't know what it is, but, you know, I'm generally speaking, of course, but, you know, I don't know why people just assume that they're just dead in the water once they get to there and just that, it, you know, it, you know, it's like you got to challenge your mind every day and you find out, hey, you know, I can do this. And it makes life a little bit, a little bit easier in some cases, you know, and you find out, you know, I can get through this, you know, if somebody cut me off going down the road and, you know, if I got through these other problems, heck, I, I, I don't have to worry about this, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, it's just weird that I don't know if it's like, you know, the mindset, like you were talking about the, the way society is and what we're being taught or when I say we, what students are being taught now in schools or is it just the, the social norm? Is it the narrative? I don't know, but it's just odd to me that it's almost that where, you know, do you set up people for failure and just, you know, be real with them and say, Hey, don't, just worry about going to school. Don't worry about chasing your dreams. You're probably not going to make it anyway. You know, yeah. that's been my, my drum beat on all of these podcasts I've been appearing on. And I've, I've done over, I think close to six, over 60, Wow, almost 70 now. And that's my message is that you, you take your dream. You don't let anybody ever steal your dream. And if somebody is pulling you down, you find a way to get away from that person. You surround yourself with people that are going to lift you up and encourage you and move you forward. And don't let anybody drag you back. And uh, sometimes those people that drag you back may be relatives. And so that's a little hard. You can't fire a relative, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you can certainly not spend as much time with them as somebody, another relative that's really pushing you forward and encouraging you. So you need to surround yourself with those kind of people. 
and don't try to make it on your own. You just got to surround yourself with a team that pushes you forward and keep your dream and keep your vision of where you want to go. And you, you just keep at it and keep moving, keep moving. Somebody I heard uh, on TV the other day saying that uh, you cannot turn if you're not moving. You ever sit in the parking lot with the car running, turn the steering wheel? Yeah. You're matter. not going in. You're not going to turn. You're just turning for nothing. The only way you can can turn is if you're moving. That makes perfect so, sense. Makes and perfect that's sense. that's a good metaphor for life. If you you cannot move, direct your life in any direction if you're not moving forward. I'm writing that down, making that a note. I like yeah, that. I thought that was a beautiful metaphor. It is. So I mean, and, and also with that, you know, you how long did it take you to write your first song again? The Rachel song. 30, I was over 33 years old. 30, I, was about so, to turn, I was about to turn 34. You know, yeah. would you, how often do you play every day? I mean, like hours or this period? Some days I play a lot. Some days I'm really busy. I, I do three or four of these podcasts a day. So I'm, okay. I'm on the camera and talking a lot during the day. Well, well what I'm, I'm, done, I'm usually, I'll head to the piano and just sit down. And that, that's the way I relax. It's just, sure. just and that's, sit down that's, at the piano and just, just, just play something and, you know, and, and and sometimes I play songs that I like. Sometimes I'll turn on my my Siri speakers and say, you know, play uh, some '60s doo wop music. I love to play along with the, all those doo wop songs of the '60s. There, you can I know almost all of them by heart, and I can sit there and play the chords right along with whoever it is, whether it's uh, Elvis Presley or the, the Letterman or whoever else it happens to be. I love playing along, or I'll just sit there and play some chords and make something up of my own. Nice. Well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that, you know, Stephen Pressfield wrote a book and he called it the, uh, the war of art, I think. And basically he was talking about that. If you just, even if you know, you might not write a song this day in, in your point of view, that if you get up there and you just actually start playing, you know, if you play for an hour or whatever, and you only get a few things done and not really a whole song written, but if you keep playing, you keep grinding at it. Eventually the muse is what he calls it. will eventually find you. And then, you know, what you say, if you, you're planting the seeds almost, and then eventually that seed is going to grow into something if you just keep at it, you know, and it might not, you know, like you said, 30, you're over 33 years old. It might not become the first week, it might not become the first month, but eventually, you know, that speed will hopefully start to sprout, you know, and something will start to happen. Magic will happen and you have something to, to go. Yeah. I tell you what, what, what I did with my first album, of course, was Rachel's song. And it has the first seven songs that I ever wrote on it. Huh. And then my second album of original music, uh, I decided that I needed, and this is, you know, after Rachel's song, I decided I needed to write more music. So I encourage, you know, I basically was a motivation for me to, to produce a CD of my music. I wanted to have a quality recording, but you, it would have been silly to have a CD with just one song on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> true, true. so I said, well, you know, I do need to write some more music. So I did write some more, but for my second album, I decided that before I went to work in the morning, I would get up an hour early and I would go to sit down at my piano and I wouldn't leave the piano bench until I had at least the beginnings of a new song. Yeah. And I did that every morning. And some mornings it, it would come easy. Some mornings it was really hard and just the muse didn't arrive quite yet. But uh, some mornings it did. And over time, I wrote all of the songs that are on the Beautiful Thoughts album, which today even are some of my favorite songs that I've ever written. And that was because I dis disciplined myself to sit down at the piano every morning and at, at least begin a song, a new song. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say that, you know, you, you got that discipline that, you know, a lot of people don't have, you know, just that, you know, kind of what we've been already saying is, that, you know, you stick to something, you keep doing it, eventually something's going to happen. You know, it's just, you know, I'm a big, you know, I, I coach CrossFit and kind of do my competitions on the side for myself. But, you know, a lot of it is, you know, they don't see results in a few weeks or whatever. Then they eventually just, well, nope, done. You know, it's not working. But there's no shortcuts to this to this stuff, you know, and this is kind of what we've been saying this whole time on this podcast. But, yeah, I mean, it's just you got to you just got to grind it out, man. It's something that eventually happens, even if it's hard. You know, it's supposed to be hard. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? <laughs> exactly. But, you know, somebody asked me one time, you know, if I had an extra hour out of my day, what would I do? And, you know, and I don't play any instruments at all. And I never grew – my grandma played growing up, but 
you know, I was never around her that much, but it was always one of those things. I'd like to learn to play an instrument. I mean, do you have any advice for somebody that wanting, especially in today's times, wanting to learn to play the piano? Maybe someone like me? Well, you know, I, in my book, I, I, I don't remember what page it's on, but one of my people that, and I, that I reprinted in my book was one of these notes from a lady who I think she said she was 59 years old. And she, like you, she said, all my life, I have wanted to play the piano. Sure. And when I got your Rachel's song album, that song inspired me so much that I wanted to be able to play that song. She said, I went out and bought me a piano and I'm taking piano lessons. And I promise you this time next year, I'm going to be able to play Rachel's song. Nice. So, <laughs> so it's never too late to start. It just, uh, but it's going to require some time on task and, you know, you got to work at it. It's not going to come just like that probably, sure. but uh, it can be done. You know, grandma Moses didn't start her paintings until her <laughs> older years. And there's a lot of examples of people that, uh, well, even president George Bush, He's when, when he retired from the White House, he's done paintings. He has books of paintings, of wonderful paintings. He has turned into a fantastic artist. And so, you know, <laughs> he's the same age as, as I am. You know, he's 75 years old. So it, it's never too late to start. No, it's never. It's never. Yeah. Because as long as you're doing it, I mean, yeah, why not? But, you know, did, did you say you can you play by ear or did you say your parents played by ear? My my father played by ear. My mother took lessons. She she really didn't play by ear, but my daddy did. And his mother, my granny Combs, she played totally by ear. Now she could read something they call shape notes. Now your folks can look it up later, but it's, there's something in music called shape notes. Okay. Each note on the scale, in that uh, way of writing it down, has a different shape. You've heard of the song Do Re Mi Fa So La Ti Do. Yep. You know, from the Sound of Music. Okay. Well, each of those notes, the do, re, mi, fa, so, and all those, each one is a different shape. So it doesn't matter what key you're in. There's always that scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And so she read the, the shape. She could do the hymns that were written in, in shape notes, but she could play by ear. And so I took piano lessons, yeah, for a couple of years when I was eight years old or so. And But after that, I pretty much taught myself how to play just by simply being around other people that played and sit down and practice. I'd get our hymn book out and I would practice playing hymns on my piano. And my people at the organist at church, she would let me play the piano with her as an organ piano duet sometimes. And that was huge motivation for me to, to play. So it sounded good with the organ. Sure. So, but yeah, it, it took a time, a lot of time, but now I can play by ear and by music as well. Do you, uh, do you have a preference on what you play? You know, I, like I'm looking at the piano behind you right there, but it's compared to like that or like it was an electric piano or I have, in fact, right behind me on the other side, that's my synthesizer. Okay. Back there is a Kurzweil synthesizer. It's 88 keys and it has a piano sound, but it has all the other sounds in it. It can do strings and horns and guitar and you know, har harpsichord, every instrument you can name, it can make that sound. In fact, Linda, my wife, she'll play it on the piano sure, and I'll sure. play the synthesizer and we'll do, you know, just play along and make, make music together. And it's, it's a lot of fun to do that. So that's why they're sitting one right beside each other so that we can play together. Yeah. That's a great bonding experience right there too. I'm sure just yeah. to keep y'all's relationship going and just something to even, you know, just have something to do together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot, man. Yeah. That's, that's so much, it sounds like so much fun, you know, just to, you know, learn something like that. And just, you know, you have that gift you can take anywhere. I mean, do you ever go and like sit down in a mall and start playing at those pianos? I've seen videos of people doing that stuff. I have done that before and played Rachel's song sometimes just for yeah. fun. And it would, it always seems to gather a crowd, you know, you're sitting there and you play this and next thing you know, there's a bunch of people standing around you. It's kind of fun. But uh, <laughs> I'm not a really a performer, so, so to speak. I write a lot of songs, but Gary Prim is the artist that I've used over the years to arrange and perform my music. So I write the tunes and the, uh, the melodies, and Gary then will arrange and perform them. And so then we'll go in the studio and make, make our albums with, of my music with him arranging and performing it. So you'll see on all my albums, it'll say, you know, uh, it's arranged and performed by Gary Prim. Okay. How long does it take to, you know, from 
to perform and you know write the write all that like have, like day like a couple of days or to get something like that laid down or what the uh I would go back to Nashville after I'd recorded Rachel's song. Every year, that was in 1988 that I finished up the album of Rachel's song. Every year after 1988, I would go back to Nashville and rent a studio, uh, the whole studio, all day for a week. Mm -hmm. And basically, that would give us, we could leave our stuff in. We didn't have to tear it down and take it home and then set it back up the next day. You could just leave everything set up that way. It saves a lot of time. I see. But it would, we would just spend a week, and part of the week would be with Gary coming in and performing his parts of the music and get it all laid down in the tracks and so forth because we used piano and his synthesizer for all this other sounds, strings and any other oboe or whatever instruments else he wanted to put in it. But then after Gary, that would normally take for an album a couple of full days of recording just the basic music itself with okay. the song so that'd be like monday and tuesday well on wednesday I w and maybe part of thursday the engineer and myself my engineer's name's ronnie light and we use the same engineer all these years and and he also is like family to me he's like a brother and so is gary prim he's he and his wife and kids are more like family now than anything That's cool. but we would spend ronnie light and myself in the studio mixing down all the tracks now, for an album like uh you know most most albums have 15 or 16 or 17 songs on them sure. so you take each one of those songs and we go through them mix them down and make sure that there weren't any p buzzes or pops or anything in there that needed to be corrected and go through and you mix it down perfectly so that you get the balance of the piano just right against the other instruments and that's called mixing and then you uh, the last step of the process is when you master the whole album. And by mastering, I mean you, you're basically making the song one on the album compatible with song 15. You've probably bought records in the past where you, uh -huh. play, you play one track and it sounds great, and track two starts and, oh, man, it blasts you out of the room. you got to go turn the volume down. Oh, and then okay. track, track three comes on, you can't hear it. you got to turn it up. Well, mastering evens out all of that sound level so that when you're playing an album, it's consistent from beginning to the end. That so makes perfect sense. Mastering is an important step of it. But the mixing part would take usually a couple of days for us to get it on all the songs to sound exactly the way we wanted to. And then we'd spend another day with the mastering. And by you know late Thursday, Friday, we'd be all finished with the, the masters and... <laughs> You know, it, it, it progressed from bringing home masters that were a physical tape. And by the way, the, the tapes that we recorded with to begin with were, and there, there's one in this box. It's a two inch reel to reel tape that basically it's, here's the actual reel. You can maybe see this. That's the reel. That's a two, <laughs> that's a two inch reel. And this is the one for Rachel's song. Rachel's song is on there. Okay. This is the original one that, where it was recorded. And that reel will only hold 13 minutes of music. 13 minutes is all because it runs at 30 inches a second. Ah, uh, okay. It's running high speed. That's how you get in the old days. That's how you got the high quality of your recordings because that tape machine was flying okay. and recording in high fidelity. Wow. And, and My uncle gave me a reel, and it's not the, it's not that big, but it's Jimi Hendrix, and it's I don't know how it's not, but it's a, plays reel to reel, but it's real small, it's smaller than that. It's probably a quarter inch. And there I, you I, go. It's probably what it is. Quarter inch tape, and I've got a I could have brought one over here. Oh, good. But uh, but today, guess what? You walk out of the studio with if if anything physical, Pro, are you thumb, thumb drive. Up? This thumb drive could hold all of the music I have ever recorded in high fidelity, right on this thumb drive. Yeah. That's what I was whereas, going to that, whereas that box that I showed you a minute ago would only hold 13 minutes, maybe two or three songs at most. Mm -hmm. So the technology has changed. In fact, today, oh. probably everything is recorded on a hard drive and, and you, you basically send it over the internet sure. as an MP3 file or another kind of file to some remote location. You can have recorders in London, England, and Australia, and in Los Angeles, and Nashville, all working together on a recording now. Do you, just, do you do digitally? Did you upload your music like Spotify and Apple, all the big time people? Yes. Now, remember my, my career was, I had my, mas my degree in college was in math and physics. 
I worked in the computer center all four years in college, so I knew how to program a computer. Nice. My first job at Western Electric, which is part of AT&T, was as a computer programmer. Okay. Oh, I'm an IT kind of person from the beginning. And all my jobs at AT&T from that point forward had to do with information technology by and large. So that was kind of second nature to me when I got my music. And the music world evolved very quickly from tapes to CDs to then downloads. You remember in the late 90s, you had the downloading taking place. You sure. may, you may like, remember, like Napster and all that. Yeah. You remember Napster? Yep, oh, that's so, when I first got started in like kind of computers and stuff. Well, Napster like, was the one that just absolutely almost killed the music business because did. they were giving away all this music for free. All you college kids were going to say, what well, if I liked an album? Why well, I'll just download it off exactly. the internet for free. Exactly. And so the expectation of that generation was that music didn't have any value. It was just something you got for free. Yeah. And that almost killed the music industry. And were it not for Apple music coming along in the early two thousands, and coming out with iTunes and being able to download a song and charge you 99 cents legally to do that. Right. That was the beginning of the revival of the, the music business. Now, of course, that evolved from downloads into streaming. And so the, uh, came along came Pandora and Spotify and the other platforms that stream music. And being a technology person, I had all my, as soon as a, as soon as the internet came along and there was such a thing as a website, I created my own. Before anybody even knew what WWW stood for, I had, a, I had a combsmusic.com website. And, and it's still there today. It's, it's evolved. It looks a little different today than it did then. I bet. <laughs> yeah, a I lot of those old ones. <laughs> yeah. But I did it. I programmed it myself. You know, I copied. I, I learned how to program it by, by looking at however other people had done theirs. Okay. But as soon as the digital world came around and I was able to upload my music in the digital form through iTunes and Spotify and Pandora, all those, I did that. As soon as they, as soon as I've heard about Pandora, I've jumped on that, you know, like a duck on a June bug, as they say, it was, I wanted to get it there. And so all my music is out there in the digital world. Now I have over 170 songs that you can play instantly anywhere in the world on any of those streaming platforms or downloader platforms on whether it's Amazon music, Apple music, in any of those platforms. How does that work? So do you just, they, you know, say, Hey, you had X amount of downloads this month and you don't have to answer this. If you don't want to, they send you a check or. or... I, I would like to talk about that because okay. that, that is important for any musician these days that want to know how do you make a mini money with music. Well, I've heard a lot of different stories that, you know, some musicians have, you know, gotten screwed out of stuff like this. And as far as our contracts and, you know, there's a lot of been a bad stories that as far as like yeah. movies I've seen and just other podcasts with musicians on it, this, they didn't well, realize the small print, I guess. Even, or even back, even back in the day when there, this internet stuff didn't even exist, there were still unscrupulous people that would come along and sign an artist and then they would promote all this and take the money. And I'm, there's lots of movies been made about yeah. these promoters that stole the artist's music and stole them blind, basically. Oh. And, you know, there's always unscrupulous people. Sure. But as the music industry evolved into the digital world, there, the, uh, you still have to record and uh, register your music with the copyright office to get your copyrights for your music. Uh, and you need to register your recordings with either BMI or ASCAP, one of those uh, performance performing rights organizations. Okay. Because they put it in a database and they track the performances of your music and they will send you a check each quarter for your, your share of a royalty for your music. That's how that works. And uh, it's, it's pretty complicated, but it's gotten a little simpler, I think, with the digital world that people – and now can re report the exact number of songs and which song it was that was played exactly. Used to, they had to do a sampling. They would sample radio stations all over the country and say, okay, Dave Combs, your music was played out of all the music that was played in the whole world. You, you get 0.05% of the pot. Okay. You know, that's the way they did it. They, they put everything in a big pot and then they sampled and you got your share. Well, that share for a small musician is going to be a very tiny fraction 
but it still can be, you know, hundreds of dollars or, or whatever. And for large, successful musicians, it can be, you know, several hundreds of thousand dollars, if not millions, each quarter that you get paid for your music being performed. So those those are the some of the agencies. And then you also need to register your music now with other other people that collect royalties on for the streaming of your music and for the downloads. So I get reports from Spotify. I get reports from Amazon Music. I get reports from a company called CD Baby that uh, basically tracks all of my streaming music together and they aggregate it and send me a check periodically for my music that's been okay. streamed. And so there are ways that you do that, but you need to have your music registered with these people. And it's not complicated. It's just you need to make sure you do it, basically. Is that what a lot of people don't know, that actually the ends and the A's, B's, and C's of all of this? Probably. You know, certainly a new new musician that's uh, not sure how they're going to monetize their music, they're going to have to learn that. And it's not going to be something that you, you, you'll find out too easily, but... You can always Google it on the internet. You can find, you can learn anything these sure, days. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. They can educate themselves and they need to do that because without that, you're not going to even stand a chance of making any money with your music. Yeah. I mean, I would figure also that a lot of people would probably promote their stuff on YouTube. It seems like, and mm-hmm. uh, I guess, I mean, I guess if you get a certain amount of views there, the same way you were just talking about YouTube would send you a check just for your music there. Exactly. They're, they, they track the performances of copyrighted music on YouTube as well. Right. If you, if you put a copyrighted song up on YouTube in one of your videos, you will find that it will say it will have a copyright claim. Of course. And whoever wrote that song claims the copyright to that music you just put up there. Now, they're not going to necessarily block it from being played because if, if, it's, if it collects money, but that money doesn't go to you, it goes to the copyright owner. Of course. So, yeah, yeah, I've had a post, uh, you know, when I do these online competitions for my workouts and stuff, I've had to post uh, my videos to YouTube. And if they hear music in the background, it's still got a copyright claim to it. Even the music was not even that yeah. loud. I was like, <laughs> I was like Ooh, right. well, yeah, I got to mute this, I guess now. So, yeah. But, you know, and then YouTube is uh, another venue that if if you, you put your music out there and, and you can put it with video or in my case, I use a lot of my photography, my still photography. Okay. I will put some really beautiful landscape pictures or flowers or whatever and put my music behind it and, and create a, a music video, basically. But then I get paid and as many times as that gets played. That figures into the pot as well. So it's, it's not a lot of money. Let me let me ask you a, a question Go ahead. on the for streaming music and for the copyright owner like me and any of my songs that I own the entire copyright I I wrote it recorded it went to all the trouble of getting it out there I have to have that song streamed 5 times to get 1 penny of royalty 1 penny so somebody is listening to my let's say it's a 3 minute song yep. 15, 15 minutes of my music is played for me to get 1 red cent Now, that's how it's tough to make a living. That's why they call it you're starving musicians, because, you know, you're not getting a whole lot of money from the the plays of your music. Sure. Uh, I hope that someday that that figure will become more of a a viable figure so that uh, the the musicians get a more fair share of the take from all this revenue that comes into these companies. But uh, right now it's it's about one penny for every five streaming plays of my music well how could that how could that increase though i mean what you know if you well it's a lot of it's through legislation Ooh, you see this is a a, a, the copyright law and the the the, it's a lot of these rates are set by law sure so there's a huge lobbying effort on all the people trying to get a piece of the pie here to make sure that they're they're able to grab a certain piece and of course, the poor songwriters like myself, we don't have the wherewithal to hire all these expensive lawyers to represent us. So we kind of get the short end of the sticks, so to speak. Yeah, no, okay. I kind I kind of know what you're talking about because with these podcasts, it's almost the same ordeal that you have to have so many downloads per whatever in order to get you know money from it or whatever. And I can't remember. So like, if you know, if you get a thousand downloads a week or whatever, you'll get, I forgot how much it is now, but you know, it's almost like pennies or cents. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. So I get a hundred percent what you're saying. Yeah. 
And, even, and, and a lot of the big people won't even talk to you if you're not getting over a thousand downloads a week. They're like, no, you're good. And which I get it. I guess, you know, you're just a small, what a small duck in a big pond, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> or yeah. small fish in a big pond, I guess is what it is. But yeah, that's right. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's an uphill battle, I think for, for a beginning musician. And I'm just, I'm, first of all, I'm very grateful that I came along when I did in the 1980s when I didn't have to rely on these five download or streams to get one penny, I could literally sell a CD. Yeah, I yeah. could sell a cassette tape and I sold them by the pallet load, by the truck load. And it, I made a very good living selling my music. But as, as with everything, there's a life cycle involved. Cassette tapes absolutely went to zero about 1999. I have a, I have a chart of it of where I kept track of exactly what I sold of everything. And it was, there was one year where that bottom line number total for the year was zero. Wow. It was about 1999. And CDs are going along the same route. I don't know. They, I they know. took off. Uh, they were really big. I think maybe 95 or 6 was probably around the peak for the CDs. And ever since then, when the Internet came along and downloading and streaming started, the CDs are down here. Yep. And I was out for a bike ride today, and I stopped and asked a young couple that were pushing a little stroller with their kids and, I said, do you all even own a CD player? And he said, no, we don't. Uh, CD player. No, we don't own one. I said, so how do you listen to music? He said, well, it's just I get it on my phone or whatever, Apple Music. I just down, download or stream it. So, you know, I can't even sell a CD to those kind of folks. They don't have a way to even play it. You, sure. can't, even buy, you can't even buy a car today that has a CD player in it. Yeah, yeah they all have the aux cords now or Bluetooth to hook it up to. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Do you think, well, you know, part of like going back a little bit on the money thing, is that because, you know, with the internet, and we're kind of still in the uh, the wild, wild west of it. We just don't really know how to navigate it and know how to fully use it except for just, you know, small little things just as far as like research and getting information. But as far as like what you're saying with musicians and podcasts and books and everything that if you're trying to make it out there, you know, no one really knows how to, you know, navigate it yet, I guess, or get them how to make the most of the money out of it. I hope that kind of makes sense what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but I think it's 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 partly that, but it's also partly because there are so many players with their fingers in the pie, so to speak. Mm. You've got the media people, you know, the people that are basically transmitting the all the, this stuff over the internet. So you have your Comcast and your Spectrum and all the people that provide internet service. You've got your TV stations, you've got your radio stations, all of those people. And then you have all the, the the digital part of it with the Spotify's and, and the Facebooks. And, you know, speaking of Facebook, you know, or Twitter, for example, sure. you've, you've heard about the controversy with Musk, Elon yeah. Musk saying, you know, I don't believe this 5% bot thing, you know, and I think he's onto something. I heard somebody else say, no, it's, it's, it's 5% all right, but it's 5% real and 95% bot. So, you know, <laughs> it, who knows? So maybe we'll get to the bottom of that. But there's all there's so many players and so many technical aspects to it in the music business that it just gets a little piece here, a little piece there, and there's just not not enough pieces left over by the time you get down to the musician. Yeah, is it almost that you know there's a big be a lot of things cut out. You know, there's a lot of you know in order to make a little bit bigger pieces for the pie. Yeah, yeah. Just I don't know how you would do that. Obviously, I don't know how you would structure the industry or anything, but I mean, there's gotta be ways to just, you know, you, we, do we really need, you know, person, all these people in the middle of it just to get our music to here and there. And I mean, I understand that everyone needs a cut, but, but that many people needs a cut of it. I don't, you know, I don't think uh, so either. And yeah, I, just, I think it'll shake out over time, but it's not going to be an overnight thing. No, and, no. I, and, and transparency. And, and, you know, as they say, daylight is a great disinfectant. You know, you can you can shine the light on something and that's when you at least can have a chance to fix it. And when everything is in the dark and you don't know what's going on is when you're really in trouble. So maybe all this attention to it will over the time over time will help solve the problem. I mean, we don't have to go down this soapbox, but, you know, that's what Musk is, you know, wanting to get out of Twitter was like more free speech and. You know, bring that back. He wants to bring Trump back on there and which, like I said, we don't have to go back down this road. but. Uh, but yeah, maybe there is, you know, a way to figure, kind of figure out which direction we need to get the internet going in and maybe more of a structured way to it rather than just, like I said, the wild, wild west. And 
like I said, I don't have the brain power to do that, but you know, I mean, hopefully Musk might can figure something out and there's other bigger brains out there, but you know, it would help out, you know, guys like yourself and, you know, these musicians are trying to make a living out of it, you know, rather than just, you know, fight the daily grind and, you know, just having to work, you know, two part-time jobs. And like you said, a starving musician and make music on the side and hopefully to make it big one day. And yeah, some great stories come out of that, but it's tough, you know, it, it really is. And so my mission these days is I get on these podcasts like yours and I talk about my music and I try to spend as much time as I can on how my music touches people's lives. Yeah. And anecdotally with all these wonderful stories that I've gotten that where people have heard my music and it's been a blessing to them and really enabled them to reduce their stress and in some ways maybe even made them live a healthier life. And it's just uh, those kind of things. I'm just trying to, I'm kind of like Johnny Appleseed and his spreading the apple trees all around the country. I want to spread my music and my this kind of music and get it reintroduced around the country because we've got too much noise going on, I think, right now. And it's it. If you turn on the TV, you're not going to be able to sit there and relax. That's true. And, and and if you turn on the radio these days, almost every station on there is not going to be anything relaxing. It's going to be really, <laughs> you know, it, and there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with rock music and hard rock or that kind of thing. But sometimes you need to sit down and just chill out, yeah. and and you need to kind of put your headset on like you've got there and put on some good music and just close your eyes and lean back and just soak it in and just let it put you somewhere where you need to be. You know, kind of touching on that, you know, what I said earlier about cutting people out. I mean, in today's times, could you make an argument for someone like you get, you know, like you just say getting on podcasts and Instagram and you can market yourself just as good as anybody else could. You know, if you find somebody with a huge following and stuff, why do you need, somebody to help you market that when if you're able to do these podcasts and you know promote your stuff on instagram facebook tiktok and all the big wheels i mean yeah you could easily do that but is that just hey to make an argument for well they need to get paid too but it's like well what's the difference i mean why Mm -hmm. i mean how could they market you when you can market yourself just as good right right well you know it's kind of a mutual thing here for you and me for example that you want to have your podcast to be listened to and uploaded by a lot of people. Sure. And I want my music to be and my stories to be heard by lots of people. So it's in mine and your and your best interest to, to put on as entertaining and as a informative as a show as we can without boring people to death with, you know, wearing out a subject. And maybe we've <laughs> maybe we might have worn out yeah, part of right. that. But anyway, uh, but it's it's in our both best interest to have a really good platform here to promote our your podcast and and my music and my book and so forth and yeah. it's well, not just and it's not just about the money of trying to sell a book or sell music. I'm at the age where I, I I'm fairly close to retirement and you know I've I've got a pretty good retirement income from all my investments over the years good. and so thank goodness I don't have to have the the sales of my book to live off of or the sales of just my music to live off of. So I have the luxury of being able to at least promote my music out there and hope that it it lands on a, 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 a favorable ear and people are able to read the book and get inspired or hear the music and be, you know, blessed by it or, you know, bring some peace into their life. And so that's my mission is basically just to spread the word. So I'm, I'm evangelizing on my music. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> well, you know, and, and just touching on that, you know, I didn't start this podcast to actually make money off of it. It's more of just what we were touching on earlier was that, you know, it's to challenge myself to see if I could do it. It would be something I actually enjoy doing. And, and I enjoy having these conversations with people like yourself, you know, and it's something that, you know, I'm able to kind of challenge my mind and like, you know, you enlighten new thoughts and ideas and ideologies to me. And I'm like, Ooh, you know, I never thought about this stuff like that way. And that makes mm-hmm. more sense that way. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, and I never thought I would get this far, you know, I'm over a year in now and I'm still doing it, which, you know, and I'm, it's still fun for me and which I like, yeah. you know, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell everyone how the sausage is made quite yet, but yeah, it's just more of just like this. It was more of it when I started this to see, you know, get my friends together, just kind of have a good time. But now it's kind of turned into something more where I can, interview or talk with people like yourself and it's it's still fun for me so if you know if anything big comes of it and i start to get you know huge following or whatever that's just a bonus yeah well i have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know the hosts like yourself 
uh, and I'm sure you feel the same way about the guests that you have on your yeah, show. For sure. I have had several of the hosts that I've been on their show. I still keep up with them. We, we became almost instant friends, really, because we had so much in common. We, we enjoyed each other's company. It was energizing to talk and back and forth. And I, I love that kind of thing. It's very, it's very uh, energizing. And it's uh, for somebody who thinks about retiring, you know, uh, to me, retirement is not sitting in a, a recliner someplace and just daydreaming your life away. Retirement is, is being around people that you, you want to be around, doing things that you want to do, sure. and being inspired and uplifted by the people that you interact with. And, and really, these podcasts have enabled me to do that. So I, I don't think of doing three or four of these a day as work. No. It's, I just look forward to, oh, man, I get to talk to a brand new person here in about an hour, and, and we'll get to know each other and, and back and forth, and who knows where it'll lead. Yeah, man, that's that's one of the beauties of it that, you know, getting on here, I never know, you know, how it's going to go really. You know, I got sort of an idea of some talking points and stuff, but, you know, I don't know if like something wild is going to happen to it. I don't know what type of person you're really going to be or whatever. But then, you know, we get on these conversations and we start flowing and it's like, ooh, some magic's happening here. And it's a really cool thing that, and it was one of those things that I never thought I would be able to do in my life to just stir up a, stir up a, you know, an hour long conversation with some random person, you know, just about whatever. And, you know, and it's, you know, it's a lot of benefits to it to me. It's just like what you said, it's very energizing to me, you know, and I get off here and for the most part, I like for when I part ways with, you know, my guests or whatever, right. We both feel good about the conversation and yeah, it always happen more times than not. It does, but you know, it's just, it's a great feeling, you know, you get off here and you're like, then that was really cool. And then you get, you know, yeah. make a new friend, you stay in touch with these people and it's really cool. You know, yeah. you know, when we're all finished, I'll go upstairs and Linda, will, she'll say, well, how was it? Ah, that's another great one. I'll tell there you, you yeah, I really, it, there's a just, they're just great. Yeah. It's a, it's a great feeling, man. It's just, you know, and, and talking about technology and like digital stuff, I would, you know, being, when I first, you know, got on the computers, it was in late nineties, you know, and all mm -hmm. we had was like the pinball and solitaire and stuff like that whole thing. It's like, and that's when my first experience was with computers. And I, you know, I would never thought that if you would have told me 20, 30 years ago that, Oh, you'd be able to have these wild conversations over a screen with somebody you never met, probably would have never believed it, you know, and, and somebody halfway around the world. Exactly. Exactly. And then, Amazing. yeah. And just we're, you know, and I don't know what the future is going to, you know, bring us or whatever, but it just, that seems like the only thing that, you know, human beings have in common is just to keep innovating new stuff and make things better and better and better. And so, yeah, it's wild to me. Like I said, man, it's just, it's fun. It's fun, fun and wild. Yep. It really is. And uh, so I, I, I appreciate you having me on your show today. And we, so we can talk about all kinds of things here and we've gone in directions that I haven't really been able to go in with other people, but uh, it, I thank you for the opportunity. And uh, it's, it's been help, helpful to me and, and I hope it's been entertaining and helpful to your sure. audience. as well. For sure. And before we get off here, uh, why don't you plug uh, your book and if they want to find you and all that stuff and okay. all that good stuff. Well, I've made it very simple. As I said, I programmed my own website way back in 1995 and I created it in HTML language. I taught myself the language, bought the downloaded the manual and learned all the codes and, and everything. But since then, I've got a more modern one now. And my website is very simple. You just remember my last name, Combs, C-O-M-B-S, CombsMusic.com. It's And it, when you go to my website on the left hand side of the landing page, you'll see my picture of my cover of my book. And on the right side of the page, you'll see a picture of the cover of my CD of Rachel's song. And underneath each of those is a link that you can click on and it will take you to Amazon where you can either buy the book or you know, even if you just want to find out about it, you can go, as you know, on Amazon and it has even a look inside feature where they've got pre-printed in there two, two whole chapters of my book you can read without even buying it. So there's the look inside feature. You can buy the paperback book. You can buy an, an e-book and Kindle. Or you can listen to me read it to you on Audible for eight okay. hours. I've got it recorded as an Audible book with me reading it. And so that's the way you can get the book. And then on the CD, uh, you can buy a CD, a physical CD like this, or you can purchase the MP3 files, the, the digital files, and download them of the whole album or the songs. 
Or if you're an Amazon Music uh, subscriber, you can just down you can stream them anytime from from the website or on your phone or whatever device that you you access your music from. And then right in the middle of my page, about where my chin is here, is a link that says Play Rachel's Song. And if you click on that, you're going to hear the original recording that took place in August of 1986 in that tiny little studio in Nashville, the demo recording. That is that demo recording. It's never been remastered, never been remixed. It is the original recording as I heard it myself that August in 1986. So Rachel's song, you can it's free. You can just listen to it right there. And even I think there's a link you can download it on your your device if you want to. Dave, thanks for taking a chat with me, man. This was fun. This was good. This was good, man. Learned a lot from you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a lot of fun. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Sure. Okay, everybody. We're out of here. Good news and good night. All that stuff. <laughs> <laughs>